Now that we know that the scientific consensus on COVID was mainly established by silencing dissenting opinions and dissenters keeping quiet out of fear, can we still trust the consensus on climate change? So this is a question we've ad addressed yep. a bit, uh, a number of times. Uh, we've never spent, you know, we haven't spent hours talking about it publicly, but um, well, I don't know. You want to summarize? Yeah. This? I would say <clears throat> you cannot trust the consensus on climate change at all, right? The consensus is going to be subject to a bias in what is allowed to be published. And to the extent that we have a complex phenomenon, which is climate change, and there is a um, authoritarian uh, instinct to silence those who would say anything that would cause people not to worry about climate change, of course, that subject matter is going to be garbaged up by that bias. And there, and there is evidence that this has happened with with scientists, um, you know, climate change dissenters. Yes. H how could it not? Yep. How could it not? Sure. But that said, right. there are very simple things that aren't dependent on a consensus that you can assess, right? Like glacial retreat, like the craters in the Yamal Peninsula that have done novel things where you've had explosive ejections of methane. Um, <clears throat> What to make of those things is not perfectly clear. But the idea that we do have a problem, that climate is changing, that human activity and the alteration of atmospheric chemistry is likely a contributor. It's a very old hypothesis based on very simple chemistry. So there ought to be a conversation. What we do with a consensus that is clearly um, born of uh, coercion. Yeah. I guess I, I would also just say, just sort of flag here, that one of the objections that you and I have had is the conflation of uh, talking about climate change with talking about the environment more broadly. And um, just like there are empirical measures by which you can assess uh, that, uh, that, the, that the climate is changing, such as the two that you just mentioned, there are many other things that are, uh, are putting all of the systems that we actually depend on as humans, even those of you who live in cities and never see green, uh, at risk and habitat loss, for instance, you know, leaving, pretending that one acre or hectare of forest is equivalent to any other hectare or acre of forest, as long as it's just called forest is, is beyond foolish. You know, a boreal forest in Canada and a piece of, uh, Ecuador and Amazon uh, are do not bring the same kinds of things, and you know I, I hate this phrase, but like the same ecosystem services uh, to either the area just around them or or the planet. They just don't. They are not. A forest is not the same as forest. It's not a category that way. And so you know when you, as we have not for two years now, but when, you know when you when you travel deeply into and your job is researching within, for instance, tropical rainforests, and you see the role that edges play, and you see the role that deforestation for uh, logging, for oil exploration, for roads to get to further logging and oil exploration and just development uh, is playing on destroying playing and destroying the forests and in changing the uh, makeup of the organisms in those forests such that uh, you have enough edge and suddenly you have no interior. If you have enough patches of forest, even if they add up to quite a lot, you effectively have no intact interior forest left. And intact interior forest is what almost all of the forests used to be. So um, patchwork habitat degradation, which is the rule of the land almost everywhere, especially in the tropics, is having a massive effect on, frankly, the ability of us as humans to get back to a place where we can live uh, on the planet and not be at risk of sending ourselves over an edge. And that has some interface potentially with anthropogenic climate change, but nothing in that argument hinges on climate change. Yeah, I think this is a really important point. Uh, those on the right have correctly understood that there's a garbage conversation around climate change. They have over extrapolated to uh, a comfort with the level of environmental degradation that is absolutely out of place. And, yeah. um, you know, I, it's very hard to describe how. Um, how poorly equipped human beings are to figure out whether or not a habitat is intact or not. 
Yeah. And when we go deep into the Amazon, there are hours and hours and hours of travel through what looks like forest, but the forest is effectively empty. This is a very real phenomenon where the trees have gone. Yeah. Recent. <clears throat> and it's yeah. emptied by lots of things. It's emptied by pesticides. It's emptied by hunting. It's emptied by uh, certain species disappearing as a result of economic value. and it, Oil drilling. Yeah. Um, and the roads from the oil drilling. Right. So, yeah. <clears throat> so it's very hard to get a sense for how degraded the world has become. Um, and so, you know, you can detect that you're being lied to. You can detect that you're being lied to about climate, and it's very much like the public health discussion where yeah. it's like, you know, it's it's a malinformation issue, right? Yeah. And too often, I mean, just like we're seeing with the public health situation, many of the scientists who are supposedly doing the work actually can't even track their own arguments, like they've just been handed talking points. And the same is, is true of the climate scientists too. There are some amazing, honorable scientists who are doing good work, and some of them are finding one thing, and some of them are finding other things. And uh, the truth is not inherently somewhere in the middle. Uh, but given that there are a whole lot of people who are just talking heads and don't know how to think through it themselves, and all of them fall on one side of the argument, um, tells you that there is coercion happening behind yeah. the scenes. So <clears throat> we have a emergency of the biota. Yeah, we have climate change. What the source of the climate change is? I mean, look, I can't tell you how many times I've been promised a nice free Arctic. Right? It, it's it's promised. it's it's fear porn. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I was promised that Kilimanjaro would be free of glaciers. It's not. Mm -hmm. They retreated. Right. But I was told they weren't going to be there, and they're still there, and I mm -hmm. can check that, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that ability to just simply say, and I can also walk into a forest that I'm told is Amazon, and I know enough to know it's empty, right? right? Um, yeah. and oh, look at look at all the intact forests are left. Not intact. No, it's gone, and it won't come back. Yeah, or it won't go back, come back unless you reverse yeah. the process that did this and yeah. give it time. And we need to, and we need to be reversing those processes, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but anyway. <laughs> The one solution to all of this is open discussion. And that means the stuff that says the climate isn't warming as fast as you've been told, that needs to be aired along with the stuff that says, yes, in fact, it is warming and it is warming because we're altering the amount of CO2 and the amount of methane, mm -hmm. right? Yep. We have to have a discussion about the fact that we don't know if there is a threshold in the Arctic where we suddenly lose the ability to control climate change because suddenly those methane clathrates are released at such a rate that the temperature just begins to skyrocket. If that's a danger, even if it's a one in a hundred chance, it is worth paying attention to. But mm -hmm. it is not worth pretending that things are clear when they aren't. And the solution right. to this, the solution to the public health issue, yes. the solution to the habitat degradation, fragmentation, all of these things, the poisoning that we are doing of ourselves by allowing novel compounds to circulate in these environments, all of those things need to be addressed by open scientific discussion in which factors on both sides are fully aired and we figure out what we collectively think about it. Without imagining again, and this is a point you've made many times, that the truth is inherently somewhere in the middle. Because in that landscape, where you decide in advance that the truth is somewhere in the middle, that system will be gamed. There will be people who establish if the truth is somewhere in the middle, and one side knows that and is willing to do this, then they take their side over here. And they go, and I'm even off screen now, and they go, well, then the middle must be over here. Yeah. And that's how a political game is played, not how a scientific game is played. Because science isn't a game. Science is the discovery of truth. And sometimes it gets it wrong. But over time, with refinement and refinement and refinement and attempts to falsify and falsify and falsify, it gets to be a better and better description of what reality is. And that's not what politics is. Thank <laughs> you.